In tonight's video, I'll go over my complete setup process from start to finish, from that initial polar alignment all the way through to the edits of my final picture. I'll show you the way I've been doing astrophotography in 2022 and how different it is, how much it's evolved since I started over a decade ago. So sit back, grab a cold one, and join me for a full night of deep sky astrophotography here in the backyard. It's gonna be a good one. Are you ready? <laughs> This is the deep sky setup I'll be shooting with tonight. It's one that I've been using pretty consistently here in the backyard since we moved in about three months ago. Since I don't have any moonlight to deal with tonight, I figured it was a great chance to shoot a deep sky target in LRGB using my monochrome camera attached to this telescope. But in true astrophotography fashion, there are some challenges in my way. The object that I wanna to shoot tonight doesn't rise until about 1 a.m. and that's when it says there's some high clouds that are supposed to come into play. Regardless, I'm hoping that I can collect enough RGB data tonight to produce a full color image of my target, one that shows off the capabilities of this telescope and my entire kit as a whole. OPT sent me this telescope for testing back in July. It wasn't compensated in any way for a positive review, they just said, let us know what you think. Also, it's November and I'm about to cut my grass. Now I've used a lot of refractor telescopes in my day and I've found that pretty much all of them can do a great job at narrow band astrophotography. When you have those narrow band passes and you isolate those wavelengths individually, the true test of a refractor's optics is when you're shooting in the broad spectrum, and in this case, RGB. Now, I wouldn't consider myself the best tester of astronomy equipment. There's people that really dive deep in that are more technical than I am and can tell you the ins and outs of optics and filters and the cameras for that matter. Me, if I can get a great image out of a piece of gear, that's a really good sign. Here's the setup I've been enjoying for the last little while here in the backyard. It's the ZWO AM5 mount with a Radian 75 refractor on top. On the back of the telescope is a monochrome CMOS camera, the ASI 2600 MM Pro. This kit is extremely portable, lightweight, and easy to use. It's a very streamlined setup because I'm using the ASI Air to run everything. Some of you may know about or have experienced the oil leak issue on this 2600 MM Pro, myself included. It was an unfortunate surprise for users and I'm sure the ZWO team themselves. They've offered to replace mine when I told them about the issue, but I've just decided to clean the sensor off myself. I've done it three times now. It's a pain, yes, but the camera itself is incredible and why I continue to use it. In front of this monochrome APS-C size sensor, I have chroma 36 millimeter filters, LRGB and SHO. The auto guiding camera I'm using is an ASI 290mm mini. This is a fantastic little planetary camera on its own with a sensitive monochrome sensor. This camera is sitting in the William Optics Uniguide 50 millimeter guide scope that has a focal length of 200 millimeters, a nice lightweight guide scope that really doesn't add any weight to the system. As you may have noticed, the telescope is mounted on these beautiful Prima Luce Lab rings, the nice red rings to kind of color match everything. They're really beautiful. The standard edition of this scope, I'm told, comes with kind of regular black rings, but this would be a nice upgrade if you're into the whole color match thing. So the telescope has a focal length of 405 millimeters, even though the ASI Air says 404, at f5.4. Now this is a quintuplet refractor design, Petzl quintuplet, although my copy says quadruplet. So there's somewhere between four and five elements in this telescope. They don't tell me these things. Things. Ah, what I do know is that it uses FCD 100 glass. Now that's a glass type I've heard about before. I remember it in a few Explore Scientific models, including the ED-102 that I used to own. So if you're looking for a comparable scope to this one, I'd say it's pretty darn close to the Red Cat 71, comparable in terms of focal length and size. That was a great telescope as well. Of course, that one has that helical focuser. So you have options. 
The area of the sky that I'm hoping to photograph tonight is a popular one and a very busy area in terms of DSOs. The focal length is well suited to capture a wide area of sky when combined with that large APS-C sized sensor. As you may know, I'm not much of a mosaic guy yet, so I'm glad I can capture everything within a single frame. This telescope is a great fit for this camera. It comes in with an image scale of 1.9 right in the sweet spot. They say between one and two is best for the proper image scale for your system. Not too sharp, not too soft, just right. I start every session by carrying the entire kit out of my garage, all assembled at once. Everything is already connected and ready to go when I set it down, which is really nice. The lack of a counterweight on the AM5 and the fact that they're carbon fiber tripod legs are big reasons why it's so portable. Once the sky is dark enough, I'll use the polar alignment feature on the ASI Air to get the system polar aligned. This process actually takes me a little bit longer than it used to doing it the old school manual way, but it's probably a little more accurate. Once that's done, I usually hop over to a bright star to confirm that my focus is dialed in. Because this setup is put together at all times, it's usually pretty close from my last session. I use a Batonoff mask to confirm the sharp focus of the telescope, and I have to do this through each LRGB filter, but they're parfocal, so really I could probably get away with just doing it on one. The plate solving capabilities of the ASI Air and the AM5 when working together are so seamless that you really don't even have to think about it. As long as your telescope focal length is input correctly and your coordinates and your telescope is in focus, you should be able to just pick a target and tap go to. While you wait for astronomical darkness to set in, you can go in and adjust a few settings to make sure everything's ready to go. Make sure that dithering is on, the cooling is set, and that your preferred storage device is selected. And turn on that anti-do feature if your camera supports it. I found out the hard way that I need to have that on during a cold night. I saw a frost warning for tonight. I'm gonna have to turn those dew heater bands on. And what are you up to tonight? I don't know, maybe. Watching a movie with Rudy. Of the Simpsons. With the telescope in focus, we can go ahead and set up our imaging plan using the auto run feature on the ASI Air app. Tonight, I'll tell the camera and filter wheel to take 30 times three minute exposures through each LRGB filter. Because the filters I'm using are par focal, I can collect a full set of LRGB image exposures in a series rather than shooting an hour and a half straight through each filter. I've been doing this for almost every imaging session and I really don't see a drawback unless you're getting really strategic about when you're shooting with a specific filter in the sky. Okay, it's time to select my target and frame it up. If you hadn't guessed it already, yes, I'm shooting the stunning Horsehead Nebula region in Orion's Belt. The Sky Atlas Planetarium is really comfortable to use and I really appreciate seeing the projected framing of my target and how it correlates to my image sensor. I can nudge it over manually for a creative composition with other nearby deep sky objects if need be. Once I'm happy with the framing, I can move on to auto guiding, which couldn't be more painless, straightforward, or hands-off than this. I'll make sure my little guide camera is in focus and then run a two second loop of the star field I'm pointed at next to my deep sky object. Then I can just tap the guide button and it will automatically start the calibration process. After about a minute, you'll see that it is now guiding and we are ready to start capturing our deep sky object. Okay, we're back in the garage now. I captured a full night's worth of images on the Horsehead Nebula and then some. It was clear the following night and I nabbed some additional exposures in hydrogen alpha that I'll apply to this image. However, because I'm going for a more natural look of the area, I'll be very subtle with the way that I apply this data to my image. Let me show you what I mean. What you're looking at right now is the red, green, and blue grayscale images captured through each filter. So here's the, red, the stack of red, about an hour and a half through each filter, the green and the blue. When we combine those into channels, you get this full color image. We're mapping that data to color channels. So if I go into my RGB layer here, you can see that the red, green, and blue channels 
are those individual stacks that I just showed you. So a pretty cool looking image already, but there's a long way to go in terms of the image processing. Now the luminance layer is arguably the most important one. This is the full spectrum of light and it contains all of the really great details, the clarity and depth that you're looking for in your image. So we'll apply this layer on top of my RGB data and for that, you would want to do that in luminosity blend mode. You can already see that it's added some serious details to the image, although it's made it a little more muted and dull. So there's some processing we'll have to do there. Lastly, for this H alpha layer, look at that. Look at those punchy details there. I'll apply about 20% of this into my luminance layer just to give it a little more pop without going overboard. So the blending that you choose to do there is up to you. Like I said, in my case, it'll probably be somewhere around here just to give it a little extra punch. So now that you've seen what I'm working with, let's go back outside for a good old fashioned Astro Backyard reveal. I've taken more pictures of the Horsehead Nebula than I can count, but I keep coming back. For me, this hobby is about the journey, not the destination. The tools available to amateur astrophotographers today, both hardware and software, are incredible. Telescopes designed specifically for imaging, mobile apps that allow you to control an entire imaging plan from your phone, and image processing tools that allow you to bring out the full potential of your data. This is the way I've been doing astrophotography in 2022, and I can't wait to see what the future holds for this hobby.